Welcome to the first uh, Iola Devices uh, sponsored uh, 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 Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a generous support uh, on behalf of Iola Devices uh, to help invite uh, distinguished speakers like the one we have today with us um, to come to campus um, at the University of Florida, uh, be part of uh, fixed distinguished speaker series and uh, be able also to uh, broadcast the presentations and seminars live to the larger audience. I was told uh, by folks from Iolog Devices that they won't be able to join us today, but they will be watching. So we appreciate your support for making this possible. So it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our first and inaugural speaker for the Iolog Devices Distinguished Speaker Series at UF. Um, we have Dr. Steve Trimberger with us. Uh, Steve holds a PhD degree from uh, Caltech from uh, 1998, uh, 1988 until 2017. Uh, he was employed at uh, Xilinx, rising to the position of Xilinx Fellow, heading the circuits and architecture group in Xilinx Research Labs. He was the technical leader for this uh, XC4000 design automation software, developed the Xilinx multi-context FPGA, led the architecture definition uh, group for the Xilinx uh, XC4000X families, and designed the bitstream security functions, which is pretty much universal today in, uh, if, uh, in, the, in the domain of a configurable fabric, in the Xilinx vertex, and subsequent families of FPGAs. He led the group that developed the first die stack 3D FPGA prototype at Xilinx. He has served as design methods chair for design automation conference. Uh, he served also as program chair and general chair for the uh, uh, ACM CDA FPGA symposium and on the technical programs of numerous conferences and, and, and symposiums. He has uh, authored five books and dozens of papers on design automation, FPGA architectures, and hardware security. He has more than 230 patents in IC design, FPGA, in ASIC architecture, CAE, and hardware security. His innovations appear today in almost uh, all commercial FPGA devices. He's a member of the National uh, United States National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the ACM, a fellow of uh, IEEE, a recipient of the 2018 IEEE Don Pedersen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Solid State Circuits. So with that, Please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Steve Turnberg. Thank you. Uh, right, so I have a background uh, in the commercial industry for a number of years. Uh, well, recently I served a, a term at DARPA, so I've got some government experience and uh, a little bit of academic experience as well. So uh, I have different perspectives on research. And those will probably come out as, as we go through this. Uh, first, you'll notice that despite all that, on my slide, I do not show an, an affiliation. I'm not here from industry. I'm not here to sell you something. I'm not here from government. I'm not here to buy something from you. Um, but I do want to talk about a little different kind of talk that you may be used to. I'm not going to give research results. I'm not even going to give a research proposal. But what I want to talk about is a way to think about what we're doing. So, uh, it's a proven cybersecurity. It's not that I approve it, uh, but it's the direction I want to be going. It's the way direction we should be going. Let me start by saying you have never used the internet. Now, I know some of you think you're doing that right now. It's not true. You've never used, I've never used the internet in an entire lifetime. I will probably never use the internet. What will the internet be like for most of its existence? It's only a couple decades old. Do you think it's going to be like that for its entire existence? Think about some other technology. What was air travel like a couple decades after airplanes were invented? Ford Triangle, taking off from a grass field. What was air travel like? There's oil in your face, earplugs, because those 21 right pistons were hammering on your ears, traveling 150 miles an hour theoretically, yet coast to coast in 
20 hours of flight time. It was dangerous. Compare with that with air travel now. What is air travel now? Traffic at the airport, TSA security checks, got to get undressed to get through the security, real ID, mediocre food, bad audio on the movie, uh, the guy in front of you with a seat reclining right into your face. The experience today of air travel tells you that somebody in the 1920s had no idea what air travel was really like. They never used air travel. So, taking the future perspective, you have never used that internet. In fact, you might not be able to envision what it's like. We're going to try to do that. This is a statement that uh, I have used on numerous occasions. Please don't feel embarrassed by this. This is actually good news. For all you students, this is good news, right? It says that I can graduate and I will have job security. I will, I'll spend my entire career, I'll just be fixing problems and you know what, the next month there'll be a brand new one, I'll fix that one and it's great. This is great news from a certain perspective. Let me tell you a story. Um, Do you know who Claude Shannon is? Claude Shannon, in 1958, Claude Shannon wrote a paper and he had developed the equation for the capacity of a communications channel in the presence of noise. He had what the optimum com communication bandwidth was going to be of that channel. He didn't have an equation. He couldn't tell you how to do it. He just said, this is what you can achieve. A few years ago, I was talking to another engineer. He was working in, in uh, on transceivers, and he, he was working. How do we uh, uh, how do we move forward air direction, and how we're going to improve the, the, the communication quality communication with transceivers? And he was kind of depressed. I asked him what the problem was, and he said, "Here's the problem. In 1958, Claude Shannon developed this equation for." Passing the channel. And I've worked my entire career on compression algorithm. And he said, you know what's going to happen? 50 years from now, 50 years from now, the textbooks are going to read. In 1958, Claude Shannon developed the equation for the optimal channel capacity of, of a channel, comma. And within a few decades, Turbo codes and LDPC and, and polar codes were developed that achieved that density. He said, my entire career is in the comma. Everything I've ever done is in the comma. So we can have full employment, job security, but we don't mind our career being in the comma. In the late 20th century, the internet was, was developed, comma, now, within a few decades, the security problems were resolved, and it could be used universally. So here's my vision. We don't talk about cybersecurity because it's a solved problem. The side effect, of course, is that we don't get job security anymore. At least, most of us. Other branches of engineering get to this point. Uh, structural engineering. Do you not still, still trial and error the new, new formulations for concrete? Okay, so this is the problem. My father taught me that uh, you can complain for a little bit, but then you have to stop complaining and say what you're going to do about it. So what are you going to do about this? Since I brought up my father, let me go back, back, back in time. I was interested in, interested in security and cryptography in the 1960s. See? Right here. Um, yes, I was in middle school. 
And so I, I was just sort of, sort of fascinated by this. So I knew about the Caesar cipher and diameter of the rod, different different your, your cipher, that was kind of cool. Uh, Enigma machine, a few other interesting things I, I had the uh, the bicycle lock that if you look carefully you could see the side channel out of it. Uh, the oval team decoder ring. So there's a there there were uh, it's really interesting. Something I know, noticed at that time was in the 1960s, I was following the literature, not so much the scientific literature, but what I could get, and there were new ciphers all the time. And someone would propose something that was kind of interesting, and I was kind of, kind of fascinated. And then someone else would say, no, no, this, this, this fails because I've got this known plain text attack and uh, knock it right over. This happened repeatedly. Uh, and I didn't have the math to understand really what was going on. But I thought this is kind of interesting. Anybody can come up with a with a gibberish machine and do sort of play fair or whatever. Oops, I didn't do that. Did I do that? I didn't do that. There we go. So and then something changed. Something changed in 1975. And before I step past this, I want to point out some interesting thing about this. Every one of these is broken except the two at the bottom. Some of you observe of those, they were security rooms here. Which we say that we do not have. But what happened in 1975? What happened in 1975 was this. The data encryption standard. There's finally some mathematics behind this that we didn't talk about, about the no plain text attacks. Certain classes of attacks were taken off the table by this. This was a big deal, made a big impression. And again, and even at that point, I didn't quite have the math to understand what was going on. But I did know something had changed. So, what changed? Consider ciphers, BES, AES. We don't talk about certain kinds of attacks. Mathematically, they don't happen. Talk about public key cryptography as well. There's two that both of have the foundations in number theory. They're not foundations in clever patterns of gibberish and substitutions. Divi Hill McKeish. There's a protocol, and it's proven. We don't talk about that anymore. Okay. There are other things we have to take, take, take advantage of. In fact, these algorithms are interestingly enough. My concern about these, these things is they're proposed, but they are not necessarily proposed with all the assumptions and consideration. Let me introduce Connie Cook. Now, you have probably thought of all sorts of things to do. The reason why what Steve was saying is either obvious or impossible. Uh, hopefully, they're obvious, and hopefully, many of you are saying, oh, of course, we've got that solved. I'm doing that already. Great. Or, yes, I know it's obvious, but I'm not going to. Uh, I don't know how to, uh, how to do that. Maybe uh, he's just being too optimistic. Uh, well, let me think what Tanya Condor says that, no, these, these aren't the problems, right? Come on, you know, we had these, we, we resolved these cipher problems ages ago. These aren't the problems we're trying to deal with. Um, okay, but it's not that you dealt with them or not, it's how you dealt with them. Did we get into an arms race and a patch race, or did we go back to mathematics and solve these problems? Let me talk about how to do this. <clears throat> may or may not work. But when I look at this, this is what I think about. So when I'm thinking about side channel, I'm not thinking about how do I lower the signal to noise, because that's an arms race. I'm not talking about key rolling, because that's an arms race. I'm talking about how do I take this problem off the table? 
The problem is not that I that my power fluctuates. The problem is that I'm handling plain text data. I don't need it. Homomorphic encryption. I can do operations on ciphertext. If you don't touch the plain text, you don't leak it. The problem is off the table forever. Looking at some of the invasive attacks. Actually, I had a great experience coming to, actually in the in the lab here on this campus, looking at what invasive attacks could do. It was a few years ago when I was I was, I left pretty down because I thought I could never deal with this. Maybe I can deal with it. If you actually don't touch it, nobody else can see it either. <clears throat> Privacy of data in transit? Yep. At rest? Yep. In use? Oh, concept, what a concept. What about formal verification? So the, the big problem, is, a big problem, one of the biggest problems I see is we code now. Poor, mortal, fallible humans write this code and it's got, it's got problems with it, it's got bugs in it. Okay. okay, let's apply formal verification, let's prove this stuff. It lets us say well, if this code works, if it doesn't work, it'll identify trojans because it's stuff that's not, not supposed to be there. When I was at Xilinx, we brought in the Tortuga Logic Prospect tool to, to, to see if we could, what we could prove about our security mechanism. And it's pretty interesting because we bought this thing, we fired it up, and, and we actually ran a formal proof in some of the circuits. One of the things we did to start was just to test it, we downloaded we downloaded some free cores off the internet. And uh, go to free ID and download an encryptor, a decryptor, a few other interesting blocks. And I uh, ran the tool, and the tool says, no. I said, look, here's a leak. And uh, so that's pretty interesting, because when you looked at that, I said, oh, but where's it really leaking from? And uh, actually, the leak was so bad that I don't believe it was a bug in the code. I believe it was Trojan. That was it. Like somebody posted it on the internet. You had to know. Had to know that this problem was a bug. So there's another one. Formal verification. Next one I want to propose another concept is air gap. There was discussion a bit earlier. I, I use the term de-virtualization. In engineering, we are real big on virtualization. It allows us to do high details of implementation. Unfortunately, in security, we want to know those details. Uh, it allows us to be efficient because we can share hardware. Well, frankly, right now, I am not concerned about being efficient. I'm kind of concerned about being secure. So if I had, had the opportunity to do stuff with Trust Zone, and uh, okay, well, one of the issues is, uh, gee, if your secure and normal worlds share, then your attack servers is enormous. But if they don't share, your attack servers is much better. Than it's just inefficient. Well, for the sake of the next half hour or so, let's not worry about inefficiency. Let's see if we get something that's correct and then worry about inefficiency. I have two other bullets down there, and I don't know how to apply them. Maybe you do. One is non-deterministic computation. One of the things I did uh, in my <clears throat> spare time while I was a PhD student was I wrote a humorous, uh, fictitious PhD dissertation. The title was non-deterministic computation. Um, and a lot of it was pretty funny, at least I think it was funny. Uh, but parts of it were thought-provoking uh, in ways that uh, we could easily dispel and the security aspect. Predict what the computation is doing, you can't penetrate it. You can only see the output. I don't know how that applies here, but I bring it up because I like it and I like the story. The other is one time pad. Okay, we all know, okay, well, it's a one time pad in Cypress, okay, prove to be secure, great. Um, can you use that here? Are there flaws and are there algorithms that we have to resolve this way? Maybe I take a one time pad and I couple it with quantum key distribution or something like that. Quantum one time pad distribution. I don't know. But what I do know is I want to be able to prove the security of the things I do. 
Oh, hey, this is expensive. Yeah, how much do you care about security? If you want an insecure security, we got that. How much do you really care? What are you willing to spend? Are you willing to even treat security with the respect that we treat performance, and power, and quality and reliability? That if it doesn't need it, we don't ship it. Gee, if you care about that, then maybe you care. Maybe you will use computationally expensive solutions. Uh, specialized solutions are much cheaper. If you're trying to avoid leakage from a specific computation, AES decryption. What do I really need? Do I need fully homomorphic encryption? Eight orders of magnitude computation inefficiency? Well, we're much more efficient. What are you trying to do? Solve those problems. And take the problems off the table. Oh yeah, the other, other weakest links. Actually, there are other weakest links that we ought to go after, and if you solve this one, then they'll just, then my the adversary will attack something else. Yes, that's fine. That's a perfectly legitimate argument if you are a commercial entity. If you're a university, that is not applicable. Solve problems. You may not solve the whole problem, it's all right. Take these things off the table so we don't have to worry about them. From, the, from my perspective on the other side of commercial industry, uh, yeah, I needed, I needed the formal in order to understand what I could deploy. Might do it, but it still might be complicated for you to expand it. But if, there, if, it, if I don't have that guarantee, if I don't have that, that option, then I don't. Then, then I would definitely get away. Let's look at identity. Actually, what's one of the, one of the bigger problems? So, what do we do about identity today? Well, if I'm sitting at uh, sitting at my computer and I say uh, Amazon.com, okay, what happens? Well, what's that Amazon.com do? Well, it goes to domain name server. You get the address. Come back. You go to that address. I get the. Uh, I get the. Uh, I fetch the, the public key for it. Is this the right guy? I generate a key, the communications key, uh, I communicate securely. All that's really wonderful. Well, the domain name server. Where'd that come from? How does it not get spoofed? Um, actually, it turns out it's actually pretty interesting. It turns out that it's not that it's spoofed. But the, the bottom line is it requires a trusted party. Do you trust the domain name server? Well, maybe. What, I, what about identity? Who's that guy right there? Is that Mark Tyrannicord? How do I know? How do I know? I haven't seen him in months. Well, he was, in, look, kind of looks sort of like I remember. He sounds like I remember. He's here. You know, I saw him in his office. Uh, so actually, there's an in factor authentication problem, a solution going on here. <clears throat> Still could be. Uh, how do we do identity? Uh, actually, I've got a, 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 um, I spent uh, some interesting time looking at Canvas fingerprinting. Uh, I'm not sure if I like it or hate it or I'm scared to death of it. But, uh, but nobody needs to know who you are, you know who you are, it's a problem. Uh, and then another thing, the blockchain. I, Blockchain is very interesting, proof of provenance. Unfortunately, it relies on conspiracy rather than a trusted party. It's a trusted conspiracy. Everybody agrees. And the proof is Ethereum. I can follow this, right? Remember, Ethereum had a bug in it. And uh, so when somebody found it out, he basically took most of Ethereum money. And so what happened? Well, the entire community formed a conspiracy, and they re changed to a new thing called ETH and, and uh, dropped the old Ethereum. So the, uh, the, the myth of the uh, cyber currency dissolved that way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same thing we do every, every, everywhere else in our society. Uh, 
uh, Jay for society design want to do that? We just, we just change. Still a good idea. How can we make this work? How do we make these pieces work when we assemble them into, into systems that we want? Okay. Well, this isn't the right thing. Those are all nice little pieces. Okay. But I've been using this, we use this term security and cybersecurity as if it's a thing. It's not, it's a whole bunch of things. And it's a bunch of capabilities. Okay. We can build our systems out of the capabilities. But we can only do that if we can prove the construction of those systems out of the pieces. So I have this concept I've called composed security. You might have your own term for it. If I prove a security problem, property of A and a, secure, and, and a security property of B, how do I derive the security problem property of C? What is that property? Is it do not leak? Uh, is it has rights? What is that property? And what is the computation? And I throw that out and say, you know what? You pick it. You pick the computation, you pick the property, and let's, let's have at it. How do we compose security? We had this discussion, right? Uh, gee, I have a, I have a, a proved leak-proof memory, and I have an execution unit, and I put them together, and it fails. What? Oh, but of course, because we don't have the rules for putting things together. Oh, by the way, I said, yes, I'm willing to find C to do it. I'm willing to give up privacy of A and B in order to gain that property. C, even if that property is privacy. We're going to do anything to get this to work. Now, if you think this is too hard, how about this one? What if you're going to incorporate a block that was built by an adversary? Okay. Oh, and software's going to work the same way. If you think that's too hard, I will remind you, you know, most of them are proof. Maybe none of them. Back in the, yeah, back in the ancient days, of the 1980s, composing design was considered this hard. How do I do hierarchical design? You know, what is my performance when I put A and B together? No performance of A, no performance of B. When I put performance of how would I know? What do I know about this? This was considered a, extremely hard. We didn't know how to do it. I see this problem as a security property right now to be the same caliber problem. This is the problem for our generation. Our systems are too complex for formal analysis. I don't know if you remember this XCD problem. Um, did you really name your son Robert, quote, close friend, semicolon, drop table, student, semicolon? <clears throat> Why? Because one of the shortcuts in database operations was to take the name and drop it into a shell script and see what would happen. Right? It would look up the table. Well, so if, if, if that's the way we build our systems, very efficient, right? If we, that, we build our systems that way, um, then we'll get these problems. If our, if our interfaces are Turing and Boolean, they can do any compu computation. Why is it that my image file has a whole programming language inside? Oh, I want to design my computer science images. Well, so simpler, only have the interface only do what is necessary, de virtualize. Um, updatable systems. I have, a real, I have a problem with updatable systems. I know the truth, the truth, the, the common knowledge out there is oh, that can be updated because you have to be able to patch bugs. You only have to be able to patch bugs if you introduce bugs in the first place. Right. Updatable is a hole to drive an attack. Now, perhaps we can prove the update and preserve its capability. But if you can't prove it, don't deploy it. 
I have a note here, gee, if the problem is too tough, change the problem. This is what, I, I started out in electronic design automation, and that's what we did all the time. Problem's too tough, change the problem. Gee, it's too hard to do all those design rule checks. Let's use libraries. Oh, I can't predict performance. Yeah, I said, extend my libraries. We, had a, we, we changed the problems in life. That's, le that's legitimate here. Change problems. Okay, well, our interior series are very clever. Uh, you know, before 2000, we talked talk about side channels, and now there are other things. You know, there are this whole issue. Um, I'm going to challenge this group to think bigger. Uh, keep asking them why. Okay. So can we take whole problems, classes of problems, off the table <coughs> so that the next time my adversary has a great idea, it doesn't matter anyway because the data just isn't Different applications, different levels of security. Well, I come from industry. I know where this comes from, where this argument comes from. It says, oh, well, I'm trying to make something cheap. I need to have cheap security. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Uh, and what you, you, it's really arguing the long dimension first. It's arguing the cost dimension first. We really need to be arguing the amount of security. If I'm putting an IoT thing out there, what do I need to be able to do? So the real issue is what you get for what you pay. And the real problem is we can't guarantee. Again, from lesson from industry, you don't get paid for what you do. You get paid for what you guarantee. If I, can, if I can't guarantee the amount of security, quantify it and say, okay, I've got something here, then I can't get paid for that. So then, so this is the way to leave this what you, you get, you're going to go out. You have full job security. You're going to go out and get uh, hired in, and the, the boss is going to say, "Welcome aboard. Your job was to maximize an unknown per dollar. Since you can't predict the unknown, the only number you can manipulate is the dollar number. And so, to maximize that function, you have to go to the lowest cost." I have just told you how industry addresses this problem. If you can't tell them what the question mark is, they're going to go for the lower cost. And if there's some sort of level of uh, government mandate or marketing mandate, oh yeah, we use AES 256, then they'll just do that. Okay. So there's nothing, there's nothing about, you know, not too much market dynamic going on there. They're just trying to optimize an unknown for dollars. Social engineering. Social engineering succeeds because our technology is lousy. And people expect to have to deal with the technology falling down. Okay. So, okay. Can we take these people, can we take the untrustworthy people out of the system? Or at least make it so rare. You know, what if it was, you know, maybe once in your life. You would get it. You would get an email like this from your bank once in your entire life. But but you know, it would never happen. What would you do? Ha! Huh. I wouldn't just click on something. I don't know. This is really weird. I'm getting something really strange from my from my bank account. Maybe I handle it completely differently. Social engineering may not work if it's so rare as to cause an enormous exception. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we still have our choices. I remember the. 56-bit keys, 64-bit keys, triple DBES, 112-bit keys. The arms race is still out there. <clears throat> but the, the, the issue is we know where that race is. The other point I want to make here is, okay, I'll give it to you. Okay, so I still got an arms race and key summit. Okay, you've just told me where there's a fruitful place to do research. Can I take that away? Can I win that game? Can I get rid of the key size on the tree? Okay. Can I get the one-time hat? Don't have a problem. Okay. How do I how do I how do I win this game? How do I take these problems off? <clears throat> the one I 
really like. If you haven't had a chance to read this lately, uh, Ken Thompson's Reflections on Trust and Trust. What did he do? He, 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 he was one of the architects of Unix. Okay. So what did, what did he do? He said, well, here's, a, here's an interesting uh, way to attack this. He modified the Unix login to have a special login thing that only he knew. That would always work. Okay, great. <clears throat> and he compiled that in. Uh, and then he modified the C compiler. So when it noticed that it was compiling Unix and found the login, it would insert his app. And then he compiled that into the C compiler and deleted his source code for that hack. So now, then he put the, so he put that in the, in, the, in the C compiler so that now it would always generate it. It was in the object code, not in the source code. It would always generate, regenerate the C compiler to always regenerate the login hack. So his point was, do you trust? Not how do you trust? Closed loop. You wound, you wound up with basically what we would call the Trojan in the bike. Didn't matter how it got there. So how do you verify? The question marks, those are all about assigning blame, but the big question, the big verify is the, the closed loop. And don't forget to verify the verifiers. Hmm, how do we do that? There's a recursive problem here that's really common. I don't know that answer. <clears throat> this is really hard. Yes, it's really hard. Sorry, easy stuff was done a long time ago. Um, actually, to be fair, as I think back to those early ciphers, um, they were really hard. It took decades to figure it out. They only look straightforward. Even things like public key. I, I remember the first time I was hearing about public key, and I believed it was a fake. I didn't believe it was possible. It took me a long time to, to, to be convinced. I was not alone. So some of the stuff you say, well, gee, that's not possible. Guess what? Some of the stuff we use every day. In some cases, I see some of you using right now. Some of that is possible. Uh, we just haven't thought about it yet. So what to do now? How do I think bigger about my problem? How do I win this? Not just make it harder for my adversary. How do I make it just impossible? The proof. What do I what does what do I assume for the proof? It's okay to assume a lot of things for the proof. That's the key. But at least have the proof. At least know what you're assuming. The other thing is, how can I restrict the problem? Now, when you come to a, when I was on the other side of this conversation, I like commercial industry, uh, I could, I didn't have that option. I couldn't say, no, no, I'm trying to protect FPG bit frames. Uh, no, I'll just, I, I'll just protect half of it. Uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll just protect part of it. No, or, or well, I had to, I had to supply a whole solution. Here we can, we can say, how do I restrict the problem? What, under what conditions can I make my guarantees? How do I restrict the problem? Am I, am I, what kind of, of uh, attacks am I defeating? Now I get into my industry and government side. So, well, okay, if I can't do it in general, what can I do in specific? What are some really interesting things that I might want to be built that I can now assert my, my proof for? Can I have a, uh, can I build a database to do queries and have it completely covered by the more encryption? So all those data sitting down there in nicely encrypted form uh, it's never exposed. I, 
can search for credit cards, I can search for DNA, whatever it is, but uh, I can't. Somebody can steal the whole thing. And I don't, and I don't, lose, and I don't lose any of the data. Another point that's always, always bothered me, and I'm not going to miss this opportunity to say it, but hacking systems is not research. It's motivation for research, and the research is, what do you do about it? You don't get to complain, you don't get to point out flaws in other people, you have to say what you do, what you do about it. Otherwise, it's just motivating for research. As bad as the guy saying, okay, uh, yeah, your concrete's lousy. Help me out. What should I do instead? Security first, efficiency second. So I want to, the, the message here is the job is not to improve, but to prove it. And if you leave with nothing else today, remember the comma. You can have job security, but the cost is your entire career will be in the comma. Thank you. Sure. So, the, so uh, I understand. Uh, the, the question is, uh, I, I said, gee, let's restrict the problem. Could we have some examples of restricted problems? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, a few of them that I that I like. Uh, one is uh, the the uh, virtualized system question. So I mentioned this before. Okay, gee, I've got a virtualized system. I've got my secure world, my normal world. Uh, gee, simplify it, separate it. Then I have my secure world separate. I don't have to deal with how do I make sure my, my shared worlds uh, are properly serialized? Have I properly, uh, is there a pack on my, on my secure world bit uh, or set of bits so I can separate them? Uh, another one is, is in the domain of uh, like a homomorphic encryption. Could it fully homomorphic? Or can I apply this to just one specific problem that I'm trying to solve? And I use, I'll use the example of, of AES decryption, because that's actually one that I faced. Uh, <clears throat> gee, if, if that's all I'm trying to do, if that's all I need to do with my homomorphic encryption, how cheaply can I, can, can, does that now work? Can, can that simplify the problem to something that, that does now meet the, the uh, economic Another one is, is the, uh, uh, I'm trying to do a, uh, a, a I have access to a, uh, a machine, <clears throat> and uh, I want to avoid uh, certain classes of attacks from anywhere in the world. What can I do? Well, can I, well, let's, let's all put, uh, why not ping my, the communication system and see how long it takes the result to come back. If it takes too long, this, this communication is happening somewhere else in the world. If it happens immediately, it's happening here in the building. Gee, I have now simplified my problem. I cannot get back from anywhere in the world. So, so change the problem. It's just because we're given a problem that we would like to solve doesn't mean we have to solve it. Thank you. Other questions? Most of the time, what I got just wants to go into the access to your uh, Amazon account. 
and I and I thank you for that. Uh, so, yeah, I think the, let me let me maybe perhaps characterize what you're saying. It might be a lot more intended, but but we have those rights. So, and we have identity, and we have rights. And you were saying, gee, an attacker doesn't care about your identity; it just wants the rights. So, so there's an interesting question: Do, can, Is there is there a possibility to separate that? That okay, gee, I've got identity and I got rights. Oh, I'm still me, but I don't have the don't have the right to do certain things, like have to ship to not the address of record. Right. So, so actually, some of this stuff does happen. Um, but I think it, 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 you you are bringing up a, a really interesting problem. That I don't, I don't see, I, I can't, I don't see a way through it. So maybe, maybe you do. But how do we manage kind of the rights issue and the identity issue, or do we require them to be the same? Or someone that looks like Mark, sounds like Mark, is in Mark's office, uh, got all the rights of Mark, or in fact doesn't have to look or sound like him, just being in his office. Right? There are such systems. You have to be in the right place in order to give the command to launch. Right. Um, okay, so, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm willing. I'm, I'm open. If you got an idea, we should. So maybe you can make a follow up see with the, the question um, just on what Nathan asked. Um, so if you take, for example, the AES as an example, or the AES is one that sure and mathematically is strong, but a lot of times. Security also comes down to their implementations. So even though mathematicians they did their job, the implementation does just simply don't don't do well enough. So even if you go to uh, homomorphic encryption or other other uh, ideas that potentially can provide provable security, but uh, maybe a few mathematicians have the right idea, but usually they end up having thousands and thousands of people who have to implement these ideas on different hardware, and then they're the ones who mess up with those those algorithms and we run into problems. How do we solve those problems? How do we solve the problem of implementation? Correct. Uh, it's strong algorithms, but weak implementations. Strong algorithms, weak implementations. Yeah, so I, I'm going to uh, revert to this, uh, this security property argument. So we can talk about composition can talk about implementation and do it. Said, okay, how do I prove the property of the implementation? Uh, and so, so I, I tell you that I don't, I don't have a, I, I don't have the algorithm for it. But I will, uh, and, I, and I'll agree that the implementation is, is important. What do, what is the security property of that implementation that we need to have hold? Can we express that security property when we express the algorithm? And some of those are kind of obvious. We think they're, they're, they're sort of obvious. They're kind of sort of the, 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 the leakage issue or something like that. Uh, yeah, OK, well, gee, oh, that goes without saying. Well, if it, maybe it should go with it. And do we have a way to verify that that happens? Gee, are all my nets perfectly? Are gee, did did, did I properly cover those with the random number generation of the size? Did that all happen? And, and, uh, how do how do I make sure that happens? What if, and and, uh, and of course the argument is going to be in front of it, saying I have to articulate what is it that I'm going that I assume about this about this. Event. One more question. Thanks for the great talk, Steve, as usual. Um, I want to take you back to one of the first talks I remember hearing from you about the uh, untrusted boundary problem. Um, you know, now that you've moved on to different parts of your career or different paths, I want to know if you're thinking that has changed. When we talk to you today, I can see that you probably have a couple of different ideas on the way to deal with the untrusted boundary problem. So again, the untrusted boundary problem is, uh, let, let me say what I think you're, you're referring to. Uh, so something got built potentially by, you know, as I said, you know, by a built by idiots or built by an adversary, and I have to use that. Uh, 
how can I do that? Uh, or how can I trust that enough to use it? Um, so uh, I think I'm, I will be consistent in saying that uh, I don't know quite how to do it, but I don't know how to not do it. I, so what, if, what is it? What is the security property of the thing I'm getting that I need to evaluate and validate? So I'm getting in, so they take an example. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm bringing in a, de, in a device that might have a Trojan in it, I want to put it in my system. Uh, and so what do I do to confirm that it's a legitimate thing? Okay, well, one of the examples I just used for that is, oh, well, I have formal proof. Oh, I can formally prove that uh, this implements this functionality, and I can uh, verify that, that uh, the, you know, gee, if it does this and nothing else, there's no Trojan, but it does something else, and there might be a Trojan there, and I gotta worry about that. And that's one way to do it. You have to be able to see inside the thing to do that. Um, and in fact, it might just be tested. But you still like it. So that's one way to do it. I have to be able to see inside of it. I, I, have to, you know, I have to be able to compromise the privacy of that thing in order to validate the integrity of the thing. Okay. Um, okay. What do you value? Right. So what is important? What must you have? And do we? The way I just described it, you have to make a choice. Okay. I you know, maybe there's someone out here who's more clever said, oh well, no, there is this computation I can do. I can do a hash function over a big piece of hardware that I can validate against my hash function, like I would with the message authentication code, and validate. Oh yeah, these are these are indeed only doing the right thing, and. Uh, I don't have to expose plain text, put it that way, either way. Um, is there a way to do that? I don't, I, what wouldn't our life be simpler if I could do a hash on a physical device? I don't know how to do that. Okay. Well, uh, well, maybe one of those. Functionality. Right? So there are different, it's the fact that it's implementation, implementation part. Gee, when I implement it, what happens? You know, what new vulnerabilities are we insert? But the techniques we apply to software, the techniques we apply to hardware, they, they have to come together. Hardware is programmable, I can from programmable logic with all programmable. So I, it, it, it colored my, my view. You know, in, in any in, in any uh, educational endeavor, you, you you teach the in this case the, the the techniques, and then how do we apply them here? Right? You apply them to program correctness, security correctness. Uh, there are other ways to to uh, to apply these. Actually, I, I, uh, I had the opportunity to heard about a. Uh, Spacecraft recovery under air problem, and uh, and I was hearing.
hearing how they did this, and I was sitting there shaking my head. Students are particularly motivated to feel to, uh, to apply them. Well, thank you very much, Steve.